Bobby Smalls. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Advanced Refrigeration Podcast. You're the host, Brett Wetzel and Kevin Compass. Why did you say earlier you were feeling spicy? What's going on? I don't know. It's Friday night, and we're doing a podcast. Sorry. It's the, it happened. Sorry. What do you want me to do? <laughs> what do you want me to do? No, why else are you feeling spicy? Because you, you said I was going to have to do some editing tonight. So what's going on? I don't know. Just figure I'd make your week, your end of your week difficult. I got to train next week, right? Yeah, it's your fault. You're a jerk. I tried to take my CSME test today and, and I did not great. I got, I, I, it, like, I almost passed. I, I missed it by two questions. You have two hours to do 100 questions and I missed it by two freaking questions. But man, Whoever made that test, man, I, I got to have a talk with them. Like I, I, I tried for, so there was a couple questions that were really ambiguous and they basically were like, Hey, what's the range for medium temp? And, and I've stared at the Sporland power head chart, knowing exactly which, what the range is for what. And it made no sense whatsoever versus their numbers. And then I got a high temp question next. So I was like, Oh, cool. If the medium temp is from this to this, I should find something that correlates where I can bridge the gap here. No, that didn't happen at all. So. Try again next week. Lame. Yeah, I know. So tonight we have a guest, Joe Sig from CoolSys. Let's bring him on. Hey, Joe. Hey, good afternoon. Good evening to some and good afternoon to others. Yeah, see, it's Joe's fault. Yeah. I can say that wholeheartedly. He's like, yeah, we'll do it. We'll do it. Five o'clock. Yeah, right, Joe. If you would have, if you would have came on at the right time, listen. <laughs> <laughs> made Joe wait like dick. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I didn't even realize what time it was. Shut up. Not my fault. I've waited longer for better. Let's put that way. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Wow. I'm going to have to have a talk with your boss. Unbelievable. Yeah, but hey, Anytime, but hey, next time I do you a favor or any of your guys a favor, that's it. Sorry, sorry to do this so late on a Friday night, but, you know, obviously work comes first. <laughs> <laughs> nice cover. Nice cover. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Let's do this. What All right. Doing? Yeah. Tonight, uh, t- tell us what we're going to go through. I-, I-, I titled the episode CO2 and pressure enthalpy. What? Because like I still, I'm still an idiot with this. I wish I was better. I wish I understood it better. And I was having a conversation with some of the students when we were teaching. I was like, hey, I wonder what we could do to try to mitigate something if something bad happened. Let's just say we lost a little bit of capacity of something. Is there anything we could do besides what Kevin said and put a sprinkler on things because that's not what we're supposed to do. What we could do, hey, I've done this before. We could put ice in the sump of like a BAC tower. We could do that. One time I walked up and I saw a guy putting ice on top of a condenser. Look Remember when I see that picture? Oh, no. They, they were like having the store dump ice. It was another contractor having the store dump ice on top of the condenser. I walked up there, started dying laughing, started shooting pictures. And I'm like, I'm going. I'm out of here. <laughs> The only, like I said, the only thing comparable I did, there was a store that it was up in Connecticut. It had an indoor sump, like a sump basin downstairs. And I just, I, a remote basin. Yeah. Yeah, dude. I dumped every bit of ice because I could, it was one of those double belts sized together. So it's not like you can grab like a rogue belt and they were tight and I didn't want to touch it because I was afraid if I looked at it wrong, it was going to break. I was like, it's about four o'clock. It's about to cool down in about two hours. So I'm just, I'm literally just get, grabbing buckets. We had a train of just buckets just going up to this thing, just dumping ice in. But. Wow. So Joe's been on here many times. Let's, let's, uh, you, what, what, which you want to bring up the regular entity chart first? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. I walk everyone around. The one thing I want to say before I start sharing anything is really with a CO2 system, ju- just like every other standard DX system you're going to see out there, pressure and temperature go hand in hand, right? The only difference between CO2, which is a natural refrigerant, and our series refrigerants, such as your HFCs, HFOs, things of that nature, mm-hmm. is CO2 is a single constituent refrigerant, right? So it's a pure re- refrigerant. It's one constituent, mm-hmm. it's carbon dioxide. All the other refrigerants out there, commercially viable refrigerants that are being used right now are blends, and they tend to have glide, which is a temperature it's where the constituents of the refrigerant boil off at different temperatures and create havoc for service contractors installers and so on so you won't have any of those issues with co2 
the one thing that you do have with CO2, which I'm sure you guys have brought up on the, uh, any of these presentations you've given, is that CO2 has extremely fast thermal inertia. That's why we use nothing but electronic valves and controls driven to architecture in these systems. There's no such thing. Don't even try. This is my plug. Don't even try to use mechanical valves in a CO2 system. You'll never make it work. Kevin was trying to uh, convince somebody about, and we haven't ever really, everyone says that it would probably be causing an issue, but like, he's like, well, how comes we can't use VFDs and, and unloaders at the same time? So we're going to get Greg on here because every time Greg, we try to get Greg from Bits on here, he blows us off. Like last time he used the excuse, I had COVID and I was in the hospital. So, so I, I but he, uh, <laughs> it's just Greg, I'm just joking. No, it's probably something you said. It's always you. He always answers the phone for me. He answered the phone for me, but he's like, I got to be on with Kevin. I don't really want to do that. All right, Joe, I'm going to add this to the stage and let's talk about it. Sounds good. This is your, uh, this is your standard pressure enthalpy diagram for carbon dioxide. And basically what I want to show you on this diagram is where you typically live with a CO2 refrigeration system. So when you're sub, when you're operating below 86 degrees condensing, mm -hmm. you're going to live in this bubble right here, this liquid and vapor bubble. This is where you want to live as a CO2 system, because this is when you're going to be the most efficient. This is when you're going to get your customer the, the, the biggest bang for your buck in terms of BTUs per pound of refrigerant. So the really the biggest idea in a CO2 system design is to get that head down as far as you possibly can, because that's going to make the system super efficient. Now, what in the middle of the diagram here is right at the top of this bubble, you have this critical point, right? This is the temperature or the enthalpy, if you will, where the system goes from subcritical, normal operation, li liquid on one side, vapor on the other, to now with, once you go above this point, you get into the transcritical phase of a CO2 system. This is when you're operating with a fluid that is now multiple different types of phases. It could be liquid and vapor. It could be, it could actually have ice crystals in it. It, it could have any blend of any type of mass that you could possibly encounter with co2 so i have a quick question because this confuses a lot of people and maybe you can help explain this but we've heard the term transcritical we've also heard the term supercritical yes differences please. yes uh, yes so transcritical if you can look at this diagram you're just hitting your transcritical point of operation when you pass if you're going vertically on this diagram when you hit this critical point mm -hmm. once you get about halfway up this chart once you get about right here and you start going up further on, your, on with your pressure, that's when you go super critical, basically. So what PSI would that be? Because I, 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 do, I don't do Canadian conversions. I see this is in KPA. It's in KPA, oh. yeah. Yeah. We're looking right now. We're looking at, it's, it's about, uh, I don't, PSI, I'm, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but I want to say it's somewhere in the neighborhood of about 110 degrees. That's when you start going super critical. So super critical would be at a set actual. So transcritical is in between where it goes 87.7 up, 87 up to where you're guesstimating would be somewhere in the wheelhouse of about 110 degrees saturated. Correct. And, and we can't even really. April in Texas. Yeah. We, we can't even really estimate that because there's no pressure temperature chart. We have some algorithmic ones that are made from microthermal and Danfoss and, and Copeland, but we can only guesstimate of where that might be. Correct. Yeah. Gotcha. All right. April in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, February in Texas, man. So when you're condensing, just to show, you know, how a CO2 situation works, like with a CO2 system, when you're going into the condensing part of the system, when you're sending your discharge gas up to your outdoor unit, whatever, whether it be a gas cooler or a condenser, based upon which operation you're in, mm -hmm. you're basically going to, you're going to come you're going to gain heat as you go through the evaporation process, right? So you're going to come this way on the diagram out into this vapor zone out here. Then you're going to come straight up. When you go, you're going to start condensing right here and you just come right to the left because what you're doing in the condensing process is it's a constant pressure operation where you're dropping the heat out of the fluid, mm -hmm. out of the working fluid. So then once you get to this point, to get back down into the subcritical phase, what you do is you meter the refrigerant into the flash tank. And when the mixed phase or liquid falls into that flash tank, it expands. 
and the pressure drops out, right? So your pressure drops out and you fall back into this liquid and vapor phase. That's why we call it a liquid vapor separator instead of a receiver because it could have both liquid and vapor in it instead of uh, solid liquid in it. Gotcha, gotcha. So then this might be better if I start showing the, the Bitter app because I can show an actual diagram. Yeah, an actual American numbers, right? Yeah, with actual American numbers, yeah. All right, so I won't even worry about. It. I was getting ready to get do conversions and all kinds of other stuff. No, ain't nobody got to worry about that. Sorry for anyone that's listening to in in Australia and Canada. They don't use that. They and, and, use and anywhere anything. other in the world than the United States. I, know. I actually it was funny. A, a guy, a, one of the guys, called me from Australia and he's giving me numbers. Dude, I don't know what you're talking about. I said he's rattling off sizes and stuff. He's like, KW. I was like, are you freaking serious? Give me a second. I gotta get some. I gotta get some numbers. I gotta get them together. <laughs> All right, so this is the uh, this is the Bitzer software that we use to to calculate CO2 compressor sizes that are necessary for our system designs. I'm sure everybody out there has used it. I just want to you know give the shameless plug to Bitzer so that they can so they don't come after me. Ryan's going to be so mad at us, Kevin. <laughs> so what I've done is basically I've picked a three low a three compressor low temp, three compressor medium temp system running at minus 22 degree on the low side suction mm -hmm. temperature and 18 degree on the suction side on medium. Now we've got, it gives you a pressure enthalpy diagram here, and it gives you a point to point kind of to show you where you're going to be at different phases of the refrigeration system. When you're at one to two, this is where you're doing, this is what your compressors are doing. They're compressing the fluid. So they're raising the pressure, but they're also adding temperature because compressors generate heat with the windings. Is that the, is that, so right now, if number two is right there, it's estimating with everything that you have plugged in there, essentially it's going to be almost 260 degree Fahrenheit is what I'm seeing here. Correct. Exactly. That's what that line is right there, right? I can't mark it out, but basically the, the 260 line coming right up from there. So if you take your mouse cursor and go straight up, that's that temperature that it's, that's doing there right there, right? That's correct. Yeah. These red lines indicate your temperature. You have to explain it to me. If you're typing Jet Chat GPT, you got to tell, hey, explain it like I'm a four year old. So just go ahead, keep going. Okay. So, so these, so these red lines that come down the diagram, mm -hmm. minus forty, minus twenty, zero, twenty, forty, sixty, so on and so forth, they are their temperature lines basically. But what you do is you just follow this line. Since this is a pressure enthalpy diagram, this is enthalpy on the bottom. It's heat, but not temperature. These lines give you your temperature. So if you look here, you're straddling in between 220 and 260. You're about maybe 250 at this point. Gotcha. If you're compressing to 250 degree gas at this point, and that's what's going into the gas cooler. Mm -hmm. So then you're going to, you're going to drop down. You're going to go through the condensing process. The, the, the gas is going to go through the coil of the condenser or the gas cooler, and it's going to be a constant pressure operation, just dropping right down to this point four where condensation stops. This is the end of the condenser. This is where the liquid or liquid vapor phase comes out. And that, that would be essentially the line going down, which you're going to connect to seven. That's going to be where the HPV is feeding, correct? So in between seven and four here, or five and seven, that's where your HPV is located. Seven is the inlet of your flash tank, basically. Okay, gotcha. So then from seven to 15, that's your intermediate that's your inter intermediate receiver gas outlet temperature. So that's the bypass line, basically. The hot gas bypass line. Mm -hmm. That's your hot gas bypass line. From seven to eight is where your liquid what your this is where your liquid lives. That's where the liquid's coming out of the receiver or the flash tank. So because in that little gap where it basically made a triangle right there, I was explaining that every single time you have one of those little triangles there, that's a tax. That's wasted energy that you have that has to go somewhere. So that's essentially the amount of mass that's gonna to have to go back to the medium temp suction, right? Is that correct? Correct, that's exactly what that hot gas bypass valve does. It bleeds pressure off the flash tank and sends it back to the medium temp compressors. So then now the reason they do that is because if you reduce the pressure in the flash tank, you can reduce your liquid temperature going out and you can gain more BTUs per pound with colder refrigerant, right? And so we're back at talking about temperature. So does that, so because it drops in temperature, but also in pressure. So the pressure of the flash tank is where I'm seeing on the left-hand side of the screen on the PSI. And then the top, because that's basically I'm just about a saturated liquid, right? There's vapor in there, there's vapor in there, but they, that's why it drops the way where it is right there, correct? Correct, exactly, okay. exactly. So now, you know, this 0.8, 
This is where you leave your flash tank. Mm -hmm. And this short line here going to 11, 8 to 11, that's where your expansion that's where your expansion device is at point 11 and point 11 here. So this is your medium temp. This is your low temp fixtures. Okay. Because typically you run a single loop, a single liquid loop on a CO2 system and feed every fixture with common liquid. Okay. So what you're going to see here is now you're going to see you're coming up this line. What happens here? 11 to 16 or 11 to 15. Sorry. Mm -hmm. That's where you're, that's where you're starting to pick up heat in the evaporation process, basically. So if your suction is set for, I said 18, right? So yep. right when it gets... Like four, it's 440, something like that. Looking okay. at this diagram, looking at the pressure diagram. Mm -hmm. It's about, yeah, if you come over, it's about maybe like 430, it's 440, four, something like that. It's somewhere in there, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's your medium temp pressure set point. Your low temp set pressure set point is going to be about 200. Mm -hmm. gotcha. right? at, at minus 22. Mm-hmm. So these are so these lines here are your cases or your walk-in coils. That's where you're starting to absorb heat inside of the fixtures. You're pushing your enthalpy up, right? It's constant pressure operation because you've already dropped pressure through the expansion device, and then you just start picking up heat. So my question. So I'm a little confused right now, only because yes, the red lines are in fact the temperature, like you said. So why the hell does it look like it's going all the way up to 180? Or no, I'm sorry, that line would be. Not you cut so the red oh, lines come oh, across a, and then they come across and then they go. Oh, up. okay. So they ride, they come down and then ride over. Yes, they ride straight across the liquid vapor. Uh, in the bubble. They, they they ride straight in the bubble. That, yeah, it's a constant pressure ride all the way across. Yes. Gotcha. All right, because I see blue lines and I, we still haven't talked about the blue lines. Go ahead, continue. So when you come out of your medium temp evaporator, your 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 gas, your suction gas, is going to be in right about 40 degrees coming back to the system. So then you go from, then you go from 16 to one, that's your suction line in between this line and between this point here is your suction line coming back to the medium temp system. Gotcha. On the low temp, you go from 11 to 12 mm -hmm. and then 12 to two is your suction line coming back to your low temp compressor. So you're saying that the suction line is going to be, so we're at negative 20. We want to typically add at least 36 degrees of superheat on the low temp suction compressors because of how cold the crankcase already is, right? That's correct. Yes. Okay. You need a good, a, you need a good amount of superheat in your low temp compressors in order for them to operate properly and not ice up and cause oil migration. Yeah. Yeah. Because if anyone doesn't know, the, the lower the temperature, this goes the same with CO2 as well as regular chemical refrigerants the lower the temperature of, of the actual baby oil, the more oil carryover you're going to have. So that's why typically on transcritical systems, 20 degrees of superheat for the medium temp and 36 degrees for the low temp. And the reason for that is the low temp isn't going to have crap of heat compression because you're going from 2, 4, 20 or whatever. So there's not much heat being generated throughout the compressor because of the compression ratio. So we just have to make sure we have a little bit more superheat coming back on that suction. That's correct. So then, they, so then here, the, the low temp and the me, combine the low temp discharges into the medium temp suction. So basically, you draw back, you lose enthalpy because now you're drawing back. Mm -hmm. The compressor adds some heat, the low temp compressor adds some heat, but then it loses the heat because you're drawing back into the medium temp. And then you're combining with the medium temp mass flow, low and medium temp combine. And then you go through that compressor <clears throat> with that suction gas, and then you compress to go up to the condenser once again. So based off these parameters, you're gonna have about 110 to 120 degrees going into going out of the discharge of that low temp compressor into the rear end of that medium temp, yes? Correct, yes. Okay. I'm just, I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm trying to follow this to make sure I actually understand it. It's all good, it's all good. So yeah, if you look at the line, where the compression starts at one, you're like right about, you call it like 60 degrees, coming into the inlet of the compressor, medium temp compressor. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's with your superheat and so on and so forth. You've got about a 60 degree suction temperature. Then you take that and you compress it and, and add heat to it, and you get up to somewhere in the neighborhood of about 250 degrees mm -hmm. on, at, at your gas cooler inlet. And then, and then the process starts all over again. You cycle your gas or through the gas cooler or condenser, depending on where you are in the phase, in the pH diagram, and then it just drops heat, basically. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So that's how this that's how this diagram works. These red lines, like we talked about, are temperature lines. So that you can correlate where you are on the diagram with these points. Mm -hmm. These blue lines. Yeah, I was just about to ask you about the blue lines. You don't know, you know what the blue the lines blue are? Lines, the blue lines, I don't, I've never used them. I don't actually know what they are, to be honest. Dumb blue lines. Dumb blue lines. <laughs> They're there to make it look better. Yeah, it makes it look prettier, right? And I'm assuming that then the green line are just enthalpy lines, right? Because that's what it looks like it's coming off of. The green lines. The green lines coming. Look, if you look down by 40, it down comes 40. up and then it looks like it goes like straight up past the red of the 40. You see that? That This one right here. E yes, sir. That's a blue line. Is that blue? It looks green. They're all blue. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. I'm just looking this up real quick. I want to see what these blue lines are. They're entropy lines, I believe. Yeah. So that, that that's what comes off the bottom here. Yeah. All right. Yeah. That makes sense. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Hold on, hold on, I can edit all this out. But there's also blue lines. Those are green. Those other ones in the middle are definitely green. But then you have these blue lines. That's a different shade. Unless I'm literally just dumb. I can't see that. I can't. I can't really see that either. And it's on my computer screen. Those <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right. lines don't exist. All right. All right. That's fine. That's fine. So I know this might be boring to some, but I, I wanted to understand this a little bit better for the sheer fact that I wanted to potentially try to see how we could use this to our advantage when, let's just say, we got a compressor that maybe not pumping. Let's say you lost a couple valves on the one side and the compressor is still pumping a little bit, but not as grandiose as what it could. Is there anything that we could do, i.e. raising the flash tank? Raise, can we rob, my favorite saying, robbing Peter to pay Paul, so to speak? Yep, sprinklers. Yeah. yeah, Kevin's right. Kevin's right in line with what I'm just about to say. So there, there is two things, two major things that you can do in a refrigeration system, whether it's CO2, HFC, HFO, whatever, any kind of refrigeration system. You could. There's two major things that you can do to gain capacity and reduce the amount of work input that has to happen to get the the BTUs that you need. Mm -hmm. You can either drop this top line here mm -hmm. on this enthalpy diagram. You can drop it down, or you could raise this these lines up these suction lines so see these suction pressures you can raise them up or you can drop the compress the condensing pressure so in other words in in industry speak you either drop head or you raise suction yeah. and you essentially reduce the amount of work that you have to do in this envelope that's all physics right energy can't be created nor destroyed right we put electricity in Yep. And we get two forms of energy out, right? We have wasted heat, and then we also have the energy in the form of BTUs. So by lowering the amount of compression ratio, by, like you said, either lowering the head or raising the suction, we can essentially put more energy to one way or another. And we've talked about that before with systems that have been oversized, and they're like, what do you do? I'm like, I don't know, raise the head as much as you can before you can. And then basically yeah. you'll reduce the amount of capacity in that compressor, and it's proven in the numbers, right? Now, what, what about if we did this, Joe? What if we simulated raising the flash tank set point, say, from 500 pounds to 530 pounds? So I'm, what, at, 530, I'm at 538 now. Let's see what the diagram does. So let's raise this. And we're at 538, which, equivalent, which equivocates to a 36-degree liquid temperature. Yep. Let's raise this up to 600. That, that raises me to 44 degrees. Now you can see this line moved over, this four to 11 line moved over. So you've gained enthalpy here because your liquid temperature has gone up. Now this line has gotten shorter because on this side is where your liquid lives in the system, okay? You're gaining enthalpy when you reduce the amount or increase the temperature of the liquid going out to the system, which means you get less BTUs per pound of refrigerant. Yeah, because it was, I see where the little triangle in between eight and seven there. I the don't see there. these little triangles. I don't see triangles. Follow the round black line that would, right in the bubble, where the bubble is. Go up right up to seven. Now go up like a half inch. Half inch? There's in the bubble. So you see the, the little triangle that it basically created between seven and eight and the bubble line? Yeah. See how it created? Allegedly. It created less flash gas there because essentially that makes sense, right? Because then you're creating less flash gas going to the medium temp. But then it made, if you had two more fictitious triangles on the left-hand side, yep. yes, right in there, you essentially then increased 
the demand now because you're going to create more flash gas on your evaporators because the liquid temperature is essentially warmer. Correct. And the line sizes are the same. So when you raise liquid temperature with a line, say mm -hmm. a half inch line, and it's used to seeing 36 degree liquid and that, that liquid raises to 44 degrees, you may have, you may get to a point where the lines, the line velocity goes up so much that it starts creating flash gas. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Yep. Yep. Gotcha. Now in that same sense, could you say you raise the flash tank up? Can you, in that same sense, slam superheats down at cases and make up for that flash gas coming back on the suction? So that is one thing that you absolutely can do, especially with electronic expansion valves. You, What you can do if you lose a compressor and you need to pick up capacity somewhere, that is one un real unknown thing that can happen in, a, in not only a CO2 system, but any refrigeration system if you have electronic expansion valves. You can drop your superheat and basically flood the coils. That creates a ton more efficiency in the system because now you're not dealing with massive, massively superheated suction gas coming back to your compressors. All right, so let's try it then. So instead of the evaporator superheat being at ten for both for both of those units, let's yeah, let's. I'll let's, change it to two. Oh damn, go balls! It's not. Right, let's, let's go like let's go flooded coil, right? There we go. So now you see. This comes back. This whole right side comes back, right? Mm -hmm. did, we gain, did we gain capacity though? Let's look again. Let's look back and forth. Sorry. These triangles that Brett's talking about that <laughs> nobody sees but him. <laughs> so, so what you're doing essentially when you drop super, when you drop evaporator superheat, mm -hmm. is you're reducing the amount of heat pickup, right? Mm -hmm. So you can see that the enthalpy gained reduces a bit so now your compressors have to do less work yeah because they're picking up less you're picking up less heat and you're transferring less heat throughout the whole system basically because you're not evaporating that liquid fully into a gaseous form in a turn raising the flash tank up and slamming the liquid down would gain you more capacity it can yes but then you have to worry right. about damaging your compressor. That's correct. You have to watch for liquid flood back. That is critically important. That is the only caveat to doing what you said, Kevin. I wouldn't say it. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. So is that why people are using the liquid pump overfeed? Because you're able to get a lot of capacity out of that? Yeah, absolutely. So the liquid pump amplification systems, a couple of our clients are using. Mm -hmm. The reason they're using them is because... What you can do with a liquid pump amplification system is in, the, in they typically use them only in the colder climates up north. What you can do is in the winter time, you can completely bypass your condenser okay. and you can use that liquid pump to pump the fluid out, pump the liquid out to the systems. Yeah. So then you cut all that fan energy out of the system and you have this tiny little pump circulating the fluid, circulating the refrigerant through the cycle. And what it does is it picks you up an energy benefit because now you're not now you're replacing all that energy draw from the fan motors with this tiny little pump. Understood. No, I wasn't talking about LPA. I was just talking about straight up liquid pump overfeed, not LPA. Oh, 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 oh like overfeed, overfed systems. Yeah yeah yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So when you can, the more you can reduce your evaporator superheat, the more efficient the coil becomes. Mm -hmm. Honestly, now to that is you have to worry about. You have to worry about liquid feed, liquid flood back coming to your compressors and ruining your compressors. Gotcha. So you have to ride that fine line. The ultimate goal in a refrigeration system is to get to one degree of evaporator superheat, right? That's going to be the most efficient system that you can possibly get. Total flooded coil with no liquid making it back to the compressors. No, oh, yeah. And that's why Kaiser Warren can do what they can do with their FTE system because they basically can drop. They drop the superheat on the set point for those cases on the medium temp and then drop that down. So that means they can raise the head pressure and, and gain a little bit of efficiency that way. That's correct. It, it seems like it'd be like a genius idea of just running that instead of running the FTE, just flooding everything and then having some nice coil in the machine room that's just reheating the gas coming back and cooling the machine room at the same time. So in other words, so in other words, that actually isn't a bad idea. So in other words, you put a, like a monster coil in a, in a warm machine room, 
and you basically you circulate the suction coming back or the mixed phase coming back through it and have an EEV on it basically to inject the superheat way high so that you can actually flash the crap out of that. Yeah. If you patent that. It it's just it's, it's basically like a suction accumulator with fans, right? Yeah. And at the same time, the motor room's nice and cool now. Your equipment's cooler. It's running cooler. Compressors are cooler. Yeah. And you eliminate the vacuum in the store from the exhaust fan. Ooh. How about this? How about this? How about this? You can take a, you can take like a tank, you're, right? You're getting um, overcomplicated. Stop it. Stop it. No, you could do uh, uh, like almost like a suction accumulator and just take the discharge line and just run that through the discharge line of the medium temp compressors directly. Those through always them. leak. <laughs> always an ace air. Always. <laughs> All right. What doesn't leak over time, right? Seriously. Except for, ex flat decides. except for brand new flat brand new flash tanks. Hey, what else can we what else can we do? <laughs> what else can we do to save some efficiency? So like all right, I see where the high pressure line you have that set for thirteen hundred, right? Yes. So let's just say instead of that, like can we see what happens to the capacity? So right now we're at fourteen one one forty seven point eight and we're at yeah, and we're at uh three ninety. What happens if we jack that up to fourteen hundred? The, the capacity should go down on the medium temp because the medium temp is the only thing that sees the high side, right? Yeah, true. Okay. Low temp doesn't change because it condenses into medium temp suction. But you do okay. see that you do see you're at 381. If I change it back to 1300, you're now at 390. 390. Yeah. Okay. Um, All spill goods. Let's watch the let's watch the diagram. Okay, I'm going to hit the play button. I just raised it to 1400. That line goes up, right? Because yeah. you're raising pressure. So now your compressor has to do more work, right? Some bitch. Yeah, you're right. All right. So you get less usable capacity because the compressor has to do more work to get it to the pressure that you're asking it to get to. That more compression ratio, less BT. All right. Correct. Fair enough. Correct. All right, less, so us back. less usable refrigerant refrigerating capacity. Yep. So we're back to sprinklers. So, go ahead. Keep going. <laughs> the only viable option. Yeah, that's really, that's a basic overview of a CO2 system. I mean, you want to lower your superheat as much as possible. You want to raise, you want to keep your suction up as much as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. uh, and you want to keep your head down as, as much as possible. It's just like, it's really, everybody's saying, that everybody that is in the industry that doesn't know CO2 and they're just getting into it, end users specifically, they're, they're looking at it like it's a black art. And it's really not. It's DX reimagined, basically, right? We're just having to finagle the CO2 to make it do what we want it to do. That's it's more right. classy DX. Classy DX. It's wearing a, it's wearing a, it's wearing a one of those, one of those, one of those suit t-shirts, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's got a mullet on it. Bougie. It's a bougie refrigerant with a mullet. Yeah. It's all uh, party in the back in the summer. <laughs> Since we already have this up, I know you can finagle some stuff around here with the, with the, with the. Raise uh, the low temp discharge pressure. So say if we had a discharge regulator on there, what would it do to capacity on the medium temp too? So we can't control the low temp discharge on the, in the bits or software. Oh, it sucks. It's automated. The, yeah, there's nothing you can do here. It goes right with the intermediate pressure, which is the flash tank essentially. But here's the thing to note. If you are at 600, watch your low temp capacity. You're at 147.8 at 600 PSI, 44 degree liquid, right? Gotcha. You drop the 538, which is 36 degrees. Capacity goes up in a low temp, right? Mm, makes Colder sense. Colder liquid, more BTUs per pound. Obviously, you're going to have more refrigerating capacity, right? So that is one way. Controlling your flash tank pressure will get you more boost on your low temp. So lowering the flash tank would give you more of a boost than the low temp, and then... And the than the medium temp, yes. But doesn't that still then put more of a load on the medium temp because the flat the flash gas bypass valve still has to you know, distribute that pressure over you're, to you? You're loading up the medium temp to get more on your low temp. So if you lose a low temp compressor and you know that you have good, you have all your medium temp compressors, mm -hmm. you could open up that bypass valve and flow that gas over to the medium temp, knowing you have enough horsepower connected to that side of the system to handle it. Wait for you. you said, wait, hot gas. You're talking about the flash gas, right? Yeah, it's not a flash gas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you keep saying hot gas, and I'm like, what? No, it's, no, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Anyway, so you open that valve up, and you just bleed. You bleed that flash gas over to the medium temp. All right, <clears throat> flood the medium temp with flash gas. 
let it because you know that it has all the capacity. You got you got your ten percent, twelve percent spare capacity. You can load that thing up, but you lost the low temp compressor. So you're trying to figure out a way to make this happen, right? To get yourself limping along until you can get a new low temp compressor in the store. All right, so sprinkler for the throwing a sprinkler on the receiver. So sprinkler for the medium temp, and then it, as long as we can, the compressor on the medium temp isn't fully loaded, we can actually then, like you said, drop the flash tank pressure lower. So yeah. then, because then basically out of the expansion valve will have less flash gas, which means more energy for those compressors because the compressor has to do less work in order to do the same amount of energy. That's now, the same amount of BTUs, yeah. What yeah. about dropping discharge temps? So say we start dropping discharge temps, that's obviously going to reduce the gas cooler load, which so, should in turn reduce the flash gas load coming into the flash tank. Correct? So that would, be, that would be where the compressor superheat is then, right? That's, yeah, that's correct. Yes. Yes. Suction line. Compressor, was compressor superheat is suction line superheat plus evaporator superheat, right? Plus whatever ambient heat you get pick up in the suction line. All right, so right now that you have that buried at, t at 10 degrees, so that's only 12 degrees of superheat entering those compressors. Correct. Oh. We have a 10, right? Now our system's normal. Let's go back to 1300. All right, our gas cooler is optimal right now. It's 75, 75 degrees, right? Gotcha. We're operating real nice and real nice in the subcritical range, right? We're looking real fancy and being super energy efficient. Gotcha. Let's go to 90 degrees. Now the bullet Holy came crud, out. Look at this. This line just shortened up and moved further this way. What that essentially does, you're now not releasing as much heat because it's hotter outside of the system. You're coming back with a higher enthalpy gas slash liquid. So now you need to bleed more. Now you need to bleed even more flash gas off to get your liquid temperature to where you want it to be. That's why transcritical is less energy efficient than subcritical operation. Hmm. Now, Joe, couldn't we use something like, all right, this, this is a question. Like, why don't they use head cooling fans on the medium temp compressors? Fair question. They don't need them. But why not? Like, but why not dissipate that heat from the body? Because those things are toasty hot, like, Hotter than R22 in the middle of summer. Yeah, uh, it, it's the inherent nature of how they design the compre the CO2 compressors. They're designed with thicker metal shells, right? So they don't have to worry about warping of the compressors and things of that nature from the temperature of them. Unless you use Dorn compressors, which don't have that. that... Which, which bypass the suck the, the discharge through an envelope inside the yep. compressor, yeah. Yep. It just seems to me, even if they had that, you the small cost of running the head cooling fan would reduce the heat of compression a little bit to maybe make the gas cooler more efficient, especially it, if you run an EC head cooling fan motors. It, it will definitely. It absolutely will. I, I think that really these the CO two systems that are out there now they're relying on the gas cooler one hundred percent. They're not using any ancillary devices to mitigate heat exposure to the gas cooler because. You're, what do you, how many, what percentage of CO2 systems out there do you guys see that don't have ad adiabatic condensers? 50%. 50%, really? Oh, up he here, lives, a lot. He lives Mostly in the, in the north, north, right? Yeah, mostly Aldi up here and uh, smaller stuff. And it's just straight gas coolers. And that's understandable on the north side of the country, right? Because you don't get up to, you don't get up to 90, 90 degrees, 100 degrees up there. For yeah, we do. periods of time. Like, well, all last summer was like a month straight. And what were you guys all doing? Running around putting sprinklers on stuff, right? The stuff where the tubes <laughs> were showing on the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but not, but not on the CO2. There was guys doing it on CO2 stores, but they were having oil issues. And then we end up going back in there and fixing it, the real problem. And then it goes away. But most of the time it was okay. But now I will say this. Most of the stores that are running straight gas coolers were Aldi. And they run a hell of a big heat reclaim. Oh yeah, that is, that is a that is another way. If you can, if you have heat reclaim or hot water reclaim cooked up to a CO two system, if you turn this the, the reclaim on and leave it on, you you essentially will increase the the efficiency on the high side of that system because you're now using the the reclaim side 
to reduce the load on your gas cooler. Now they're running air reclaim, which I think is a thousand times better. And you get better quality of heat for sure. Correct. And they're running as dehumidification. So they're running 50 degree air through it, through the CES units. Yep. So it's, it's so cold coming back. I thought this was a 105 degree day. It was 61 degrees coming back on the heat reclaim line. Wow. You could almost buy, you could bypass it. It was doing more harm going through the gas cooler. Yeah, absolutely. But the system didn't have any bypass in it. So it went straight up to the gas cooler, right? It it went straight up to the gas cooler after it came back from the heat reclaim. Such a waste of energy. Totally agree. Totally agree. What you could do in that situation is you could go static condensing and just let that, that go through there, but you're going to pick up heat from the ambient air, right? Correct. So yeah. I, unfortunately with a system like that, they missed a huge, they missed a huge gain there when they're running heat reclaim and they could be bypassing all that and just running like a freight train. It's a hundred degrees outside. It's humid as could be that that dehumidification is running as much as it can. Yep. So it's running full tilt. Yeah. And that's something that, I mean, this is, this opportunity has presented itself with regular DX systems as well, just not to the the extreme that you see with CO2 because CO2 has such high quality heat on the high side, right? <clears throat> now, you this see it is, on the X systems as well. This is something that I've been going back and forth with some people on is the actual going of transcritical in heat reclaim, forcing it. Now, yeah, in, other words, in other words, to get the false heat so that you can provide your reclaim. Yes. Now, I've seen it both ways, and I've been looking at KW uh, charts from some, some stores, and I'm not seeing it. Like, I'm not seeing the benefit of running in transcritical mode to for heat reclaim versus what we already have. Just the heat of compression from running, I don't know, like 60, 70 degree day and yeah. running like air heat reclaim, I'm yeah. not seeing the benefit of running it in transcritical mode. The, the, the KW doesn't match up. I 100% agree with you because if you look at this pH diagram, mm-hmm. you're at the end here. This temperature is not going to change based on if you change this line over here. So run your system in subcritical mode, right? You're yep. still going to get the quality of heat out of the outlet of the compressor that you would either subcritical or transcritical. There is no difference. You're still going to have 250 degrees on the outlet of that compressor, right? You're just going to, your gas cooler just becomes oversized on a lower ambient day. So you get that, this two to four line gets longer, right? Now, I was told the actual, when it's transcritical, the volume of fluid moving through the actual heat exchanger increases. So say it's an air-cooled heat exchanger and it's, quality and heat rejection is much more than it would be running subcritical. And if you think about it, when you're transcritical, your pressure is higher, but your enthalpy is also much higher. So you have a lot of latent heat in that gas, right? That transcritical gas. So you're definitely going to be more efficient on a heat or a hot water reclaim scheme with transcritical fluid than you would with subcritical fluid because it just has naturally has more heat in it to yeah. get. You get more heat out of it. I just don't see it in the KW usage. Like I, I don't see it panning out. It doesn't. Here's the thing, Kevin, H- how much heat do you need? Unification, how much heat do you really need? Not that 200, much. 200 degree gas operating subcritically will get you right where you need to be as far as dehumidification or even a primary heating source is concerned in an HVAC situation. Yeah, if you absolutely needed it to boost in the wintertime, like up here, gas is cheaper than electric. So it's, I, I don't see the, I, if you need auxiliary heat running transcritical in the middle of winter, you're losing all of your beneficial savings that your savings, you're saving by running down lower head. Totally agree with you. Yes. Just, just to save a little bit of gas, which, I mean, KW to gas up north doesn't, gas is way cheaper than electric. Yep, absolutely. I, I the, amount, you, the amount you pay for a therma gas is, is quite a bit less than the amount you pay for a KW of electricity, for sure. And, and we're still running what you would be running 
boosted on a, a normal HFC or HFO system where you're using an A8 to raise up the the heat reclaim line in the middle of winter time on, on, a, on a standard rack, you're still way above what you would get with that. You're talking summertime discharge temps running subcritical still. Correct. Correct. Yes. So that I don't see the benefit uh, out of it besides you're getting a little bit more heat out of it. Yeah, you're going to transfer more heat, but the KW benefit doesn't pan out to me. No, and the reason why is because the HVAC unit controller is going to say, I've dehumidified. I have a sensor in my system that reads the, the reads the humidity of my airstream. I've dropped below. I'm going to cut off heat reclaim because I don't need it anymore. Because the, because the hotter fluid is going to reheat the air faster, right? Yeah, then you're going to get cycling, and then when you start yep. cycling, that's when all efficiency gains are lost with everything. That's correct. That's correct. It's, it's better to have even steep and flow all the time in, in any given – in any refrigeration system, for sure. So I'm pretty sure you probably can't do this in, the, in this program, but do you guys have any programs where it actually shows what would happen if you would essentially use – the flash tank is essentially almost like an intercooler. So instead of taking the, the discharge gas of the, take the discharge gas of the medium temp and drive yeah. it through the top. Cause in that top of that flash tank, you're gonna, it's not, yeah, it's vapor, but you have like a vapory saturated type deal going on. So I'm wondering, would, would there be any gains at the top where that in there, or would you you'd be taking energy from one section and just transferring it to another? In other words, so instead of having your drop leg of your gas cooler dropping into through the HPV into the, the flash tank, where what would you put into here? What would you? Sorry, put sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I meant the low temp. Yeah. So basically, you're pre cooling it before it actually goes in the ass end of the suction comp- of the medium temp compressors. Yeah, that's a terrible idea. So in other words, putting a D superheater in. Yeah. Now yeah, see, it works. The so problem is, is, it becomes a floodback cannon. So this is an absolute requirement when you when your low temp load is larger than your medium temp load in a booster system. You must have a D superheater in the discharge line of your low temp compressors. Have you actually had that where the medium temp load is yeah. lower? Yeah. Yes. Really? really? Yes. Really? Any freezer warehouse, you're going to have that issue. Now, right? is that just a booster rack with just low temp load, basically? And the medium no. temp load is just the low temp? No, so it's it, this only applies when you have a true booster rack where you have medium temp loads that you have to serve and you have low temp loads that you have to serve, but the low temp loads are larger in, in some capacity or some requirement than the medium temp. And the reason for that is the low temp, the heat come, that comes out of that comp- those compressors on the low temp is going to be pretty pretty warm, right? And what you don't want to do is you don't want to heat the medium temp suction gas up to the point where the medium temp compressors can't handle that, right? So you put a D superheater in and you just take a little bit off the top, right? With a subcooler circuit or whatever. And you desuperheat that gas before it goes into the medium temp suction. So what you're just use, using a little, when you say desuperheating, are we in, just injecting some liquid there? Or are we actually taking that and running a heat exchanger over to some liquid that's coming out of the flash tank or both? You could do either or, yes. What you're yeah, doing I'm... is basically, this is just a, this is just an inner cooler, basically. It's, it's a way of cooling down the discharge gas coming out of the low ton compressors. I've seen it where they pipe it into the, the gas cooler also. They have a separate circuit separate going line. to the, Yeah, they have a separate circuit going to the gas cooler with three-way valve. I'm not a fan of that, though, because like, I've seen it, I've seen it kill an entire rack of compressors because wow. if, if that three-way valve were to open and it was yep. super cold out, yep. then it instantly condenses and yep. now you have pure liquid entering the medium temp. Yep, absolutely. And you wash your compressors out and they die, right? Yeah, it, it was bad enough where it blew the head gaskets. Damn. When you think about it, I don't have to say it, but I'm going to say it anyway. Liquid is incompressible, right? Can, just for how long? For how long? Not long. <laughs> well, I forget who actually said it. Compressors aren't, uh, they don't die. They're they are murdered. Oh, uh, yeah. Wasn't that, uh, who was, I just heard that. Could have been Ty Brenneman. Might have been, it was, yeah. It was all, also Brett on one of his rants that went on for, 20 minutes. One of his diatribes. Thanks, Joe. Oh, you were a friend. 
Fellers, <laughs> Fellers, 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 Fellers yeah. eyes do the rolly thing. <laughs> I think Greg will know what I'm talking about. So I told that story to the, the, the set of students that I was talking to, and then the whole time, like I heard like underneath their breath, look, he's doing it. He's doing it. Oh yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's, you know, Rain Man's coming out, and it's just like some stuff's about to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, this was extremely helpful. Yep. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad, this, I'm this glad, good. I'm glad to hear that. And the one thing that I didn't bring up for everyone that's, that's watching this is hey, you're, an, you're an Eagles fan. No, I'm a Philadelphia. I'm a Philadelphia fan through and through. So, so, if you look at the diagram over here, they have temperatures. So, if you look at this temperature that's listed above this medium temp compressor group, it correlates to what's on this diagram, right? Mm -hmm. So you can follow the diagram. And you can actually follow it in the cycle as well, in, in the mechanical cycle of the system. So this Bitzer software is pretty, it's pretty intelligent. It really does, it shows you what you need to know. Yeah, I've used this a handful of times. I'm, I'm just actually starting to get used to it. I started trying to fill around with the Copeland software. And we're supposed to get Giacomo back on so he can explain the Dorn one. Have okay. you ever used that? Have you used that one before? I have used the Dorn software, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I don't specify too many Dorans yet. I haven't been able to get a bunch of customers to, to buy in, but they're starting to gain popularity, and they're for with good reason too. He, he was showing us some of the stuff on there. It's ridiculous. Like he was showing a single stage low temp compressor. It didn't have to have a medium temp, and the thing yeah. was rocking and rolling just straight along. Now we're never gonna get that sponsorship if you don't stop. <laughs> 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 I hate you. <laughs> you guys should be able to get a Bitzer sponsorship because we're showing our software on the screen, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't screw that up. We'll talk about that off air. I really appreciate you coming on, Joe. It's been great as always. I think you may be our highest repeat guest at this point. Um, this is my, what, third time, I think? I think so, Fourth yeah. time, I think. Fourth time, fourth time. Four episodes, three times, right? Well, see, this time I actually remembered not to call you Joseph because I know how much you hate it, so I didn't do that this time. So hey, thanks, I, thanks, I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> thanks a lot again for coming on, Joe. We'll talk to you later. Absolutely, have a good one, guys. All right, bye.